back. Now, very few would claim to have a similar life experience because it truly is one that reads like a movie script. From fighting for an independent Mozambique to transforming its education system to becoming the woman alongside two powerful African leaders. Grasha Michelle's life has been dedicated to making impact. At the center of her work and even through her trust, Mrs. Michelle has championed the women's agenda across the continent, once saying, quote, the secret of overcoming Africa's developmental issues lies in transforming the fates of its women. I sat down with her during her visit to the country to discuss her legacy and her continued work in women's economic empowerment. Grasha Machel is a name that will go down in history as one of many firsts. Perhaps the most unique and most notable would be for being married to two powerful African leaders first of Mozambique's revolutionary first president, Samora Machel, then as the third wife of South African leader, Nelson Mandela. You hold a very unique position of being a former first lady of two African nations. From that experience, how did you start to craft some of the causes that you care about now and see these are the areas that I want to champion? The causes I am engaged with chose me much earlier in life. I can take you back to the time I became Minister of Education and I had to watch how the performance of girls in the system was progressing. And I realized there's something wrong. Girls are not performing well. I realized girls are dropping out at after a certain period, and my interests started there. Her spirit to challenge and change the status quo started in 1973, when she joined the Mozambican Liberation Front as a school teacher. She would eventually rise to become the country's first minister of education and culture, the only woman in cabinet. In the 14 years she served as education minister, illiteracy reduced by 72 percent and school enrollment for boys increased to over 90 percent and to 75 percent for girls. So it is an evolution. It's not like I chose. No, my causes chose me and they have had different stages, different focuses, but it, it has been from the time I was 29 when I became minister. So what I'm working on today is a focus which is on women in the economy, but asking the same question. Why women don't have the same opportunities? Why they're not growing? Why they are only at the so-called informal, or if it's not informal, they are small and medium only? Why? You talked about women-owned businesses having issues of formalization. Um, and even though Africa boasts the most number of women entrepreneurs, which is fantastic, that is still a challenge. We need to get them into the formal system. We need to scale them. What more do you think needs to be done to get them to where they need to thrive? One issue about formalization is that I don't think there are many African countries who understand that it is the nation which is losing when millions of women are in the informal sector. Because they don't count. It's as if they don't exist. So if you understand that, you will have policies, you will have strategies, you will have plans of how do you bring them into the formal economy. There are not many governments who are doing this. Second. Yeah, we say Africa is vibrant because women are, in this, are entrepreneurs and they're doing extremely well, better than other continents. But they are only small and medium. Small and medium businesses that are struggling to raise enough finances to grow. 
According to statistics, the women's financing gap is to the tune of $42 billion. Our Women in Agribusiness Network has strengthened 20 female-owned seed companies and 2,000 smallholder farmers to produce the Grasha Michelle Trust's Women Creating Wealth Program and the African Development Bank's Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa are trying to close that gap and have so far supported over 500 women-owned businesses across Africa to get investor ready and raise that critical funding. But we decided to work with what we, the missing middle, to say those who are small, those who are medium, they have a chance, they are formal already, they have a chance of graduating, become bigger and to have a much better say in the decision making and even in the shaping of the economy in the shaping of the future of our nations when you are too small no one listen to you mrs Marshall's voice is one very few ignored though from a continental to a global stage 25 years ago grasa Marshall released her seminal report the impact of war on children, exposing the unique horrors faced by children living in conflict. From producing a UNICEF report that would essentially change the way the United Nations responds in conflict zones after being appointed the UN independent expert on the impact of armed conflict on children to helping form the elders, a consortium of global leaders working for peace, justice and human rights. Mrs. Michelle has always used her influence to speak to and at times diffuse some of the world's most intractable conflicts. Finally, um, you know, you are the deputy chair of the elders. It gives you the global view on what's happening across the world. Um, and there's a lot happening between the Ukraine war, uh, climate change, mm -hmm. and closer home, the situation in Sudan. We can't, though, lose sight of the women's advancement agenda. Mm -hmm. And how do we continue doing that, even with these competing interests? You see, uh, one of the pillars of our work as the elders, it's exactly to get women at the center of whatever are the policies, whatever are the shaping of institutions, whatever are the shaping of uh, agendas, and even to the point where when we are asked to intervene in certain spaces, although we don't do it openly, we demand that we are not going to be talking to a group which is only male. I mean, some of the policies which were adopted by United Nations, I'll give you an example, and it was this one Tutu who was our chair, and who sat, he, he didn't sit, who participated and he lobbied, you know, with his, <laughs> yeah, as a bishop, mm. to convince the development of the SDGs and to say, girls not brides have to become part of uh, global agenda because if you protect girls and they realize fully their potential we counted at the time six of the sdgs would be touched and implemented only with that and we explained how so that's to tell you that uh, we have been always conscious that uh, there is no one agenda which have to leave out women in different ages, in fact. It's not only the adults, and that's why we talk of, of girls. So the elders have been very consistent, very, very consistent on this. And uh, in fact, I mean, it's not by chance that now we have uh, the chair of the elders. It's Mary Robinson. Yes. Thank you so much, Mrs. Michelle, for your time. We mm -hmm. truly appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.